Tesla's 2023 impact report is out and there are a few doozies in terms of product cost and safety. And Elon Musk is apparently building a gigafactory of compute for XAI. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I wanna start with this brief Jakarta post about Elon Musk and XAI and building a quote, gigafactory of compute. So the title is, Musk plans largest ever supercomputer for XAI startup report. Elon Musk has told investors he plans to build a supercomputer dubbed gigafactory of compute to support the development of his artificial intelligence startup XAI, an industry news outlet reported Saturday. According to the article, billionaire tech mogul Elon Musk has told investors he plans to build a supercomputer dubbed, quote, Gigafactory of Compute to support the development of his artificial intelligence startup XAI, an industry news outlet reported Saturday. Musk wants the supercomputer, which will string together 100,000 NVIDIA chips operational by fall of 2025 and, quote, will hold himself personally responsible for delivering it, the information said. The planned supercomputer would be at least four times the size of the biggest GPU clusters that exist today, such as those used by Meta to train its AI models, Musk was quoted as saying during a presentation to investors this month. Since OpenAI's generative AI tool, ChatGPT, exploded onto the scene in 2022, the technology has been an area of fierce competition between tech giants Microsoft and Google, as well as Meta and startups like Anthropic and Stability AI. Musk is one of the world's few investors with deep enough pockets to compete with OpenAI, Google, or Meta on AI. XAI is developing a chatbot named Grok, which can access social media platform X, the former former Twitter, which is also owned by Musk in real time. So this brief article is important for a few reasons. Number one, Elon is planning on competing with the likes of Google and OpenAI and Microsoft. That's important to understand that he's not just willing to let XAI take a backseat to it, and he's willing to invest what's going to have to be a lot of money into this server cluster. Second of all, the article indicates that it's stringing together 100,000 NVIDIA chips. That doesn't include Dojo. It's unclear whether this is actually the case or not, but apparently that's what Elon told investors, that it was going to be 100,000 NVIDIA. NVIDIA chips. Number one, that's got to make NVIDIA happy and anybody invested in NVIDIA. But also this means that Elon is not really pushing forward Dojo, at least for this supercomputer cluster, or at least he's not telling people that he is. Number three, Elon made this investor presentation around the time that Microsoft and OpenAI talked about building a quote, whale-sized server cluster for the next version of ChatGPT that's going to be coming out. So the table stakes keep getting bigger and bigger in terms of the amount of compute that's going to be required to train the next generation. AI. Next up, as the quote states, Elon says he's holding himself personally responsible for having this operational about a year and a half from now, or the fall of 2025. And finally, I heard, it's not in this article, but I heard that this string of 100,000 NVIDIA chips is going to act like a single computer, not a whole bunch of them together. Don't know exactly how that's going to work. Maybe what this means is it's the equivalent of 100,000 NVIDIA chips, and it's actually going to be Dojo, because one of the whole points about Dojo was the incredible speed of transmission of data back and forth between the different dojo tiles. And so it makes me wonder if they're actually going to be using dojo or if they're going to be taking some of the technology from building dojo and retrofit that to NVIDIA's current chips. So very unclear, but stay tuned because as we find out more information, I predict it will be very interesting to see how XAI builds their server cluster different than these other companies might be thinking about. All right, and from that, let's turn to Tesla's impact report 2023, which just came out. I'm going to just look at the product and safety category today that starts on page 54, as you can see. And of course, if you want me to talk about other areas, definitely just let me know in the comments. First, we'll start with the Model Y being priced below the average new vehicle cost. You can see here the starting price before incentives for the Model Y is about $45,000. The average new vehicle cost is over $47,000. When you add in the incentives that most of us qualify for, you're actually looking at about $37,500, which is substantially cheaper than the average cost. Now, as a caveat, let's note this is not the median cost of a new vehicle, but the average. The average is going to be highly skewed by a couple of two and a half million dollar, you know, cars, supercars or something like that. That's going to push the average way up. The median cost of a car in the United States is probably much, much lower. I have not researched it, but my guess would be it's well below $40,000, probably more in the range of $35,000. So in that case, even with the incentives, the Model Y is probably still a little more expensive than the median cost of a new vehicle in the United States, but it's it's gonna be pretty darn close. But here's where things get really interesting. Notice that the total cost of Model Y ownership per mile is similar to mass market ICE vehicles. And this is interesting because they're looking at the Model Y and the Model Y is the more expensive car. 
So if you look at the Model 3, it's gonna do even better. So they're kind of taking like the average SUV car versus other SUV type vehicles. So you can see the BMW X3 is way out quote in front with $1.17 per mile. That's very, very expensive. Honda CRV and Toyota RAV4 are both 68 cents per mile. And that's a pretty reasonable comparison to a Model Y because we're looking at similar size vehicles. But you can see the Model Y is 70 cents per mile for the rear wheel drive long range. Now, of course, that cost is gonna go up somewhat for the all wheel drive long range. But anyway, we're looking at a car whose sticker price is substantially more than these other vehicles. But when you drive it over the lifetime of the vehicle, the cost is basically the same between that and these other more mass market vehicles. Even though you get something that's more like like a premium experience like a BMW, you're getting it for the cost of a more mass market vehicle. And of course, a major reason for this is electric vehicles are less expensive to fuel than gasoline powered vehicles. The cost of electricity to power Model Y is up to three times lower than a comparable ICE vehicle. This results in approximately $7,000 of fuel savings over five years and 60,000 miles. And just touching on this slide real quick, making EVs even more affordable, the important metric here is that Tesla has reduced the cost to build a single vehicle 50% since 2018. That's only six years and they've reduced the cost to build these things by half. That is impressive. The next slide, we can actually see that Teslas get driven more miles than the average US vehicle. The average US vehicle is driven about 11,000 miles while the Tesla is driven almost 14,000 miles per year. And I will tell you that we drive both of our cars more than 14,000 miles a year. So yeah, we're definitely adding to that average. Next, Tesla tells us about the very fast charging times. You can get up to 200 miles of range in 15 minutes of charging. I assume that's with the V4 supercharger. I don't get quite that much. I would say more like 20 minutes at 250 kilowatts, but still Still, it's very, very fast. It's clearly still not nearly as fast as a gas car that takes about three or four minutes to fill up, but it's not that long. And remember, this is only for road trips where this is consequential. When you're using it at home, you just plug it in at night and it's charged up in the morning. And then Tesla shows us this incredibly beautiful graphic, which is all the superchargers around the world. So you can see the United States has a lot. Europe has a real lot. China has quite a few. You can see a few in the Middle East and some in Australia as well. But look at the uptime here. All of of these are above 99.9% .9 uptime. 2019 was 99.9, .9, all the way up to 2023, which is 99.97. .9 so that means you basically never have to worry about a supercharger being active and being available to use. And I have found that we've done a lot of road trips with our Tesla Model Y and Model 3, and the superchargers are just always working. It is a huge advantage to Tesla that you never have to worry about their supercharger network. And then we turn to safety. As Tesla notes, all Tesla safety features come standard, and that is a really big deal. Note that Tesla says that their vehicles come equipped with specifically designed crumple zones, airbags, pre-tensioning seat belts, and many other technologies. Beyond the star ratings, we push ourselves to learn more and more about passive and active safety from our fleet. And of course, note they say the safest crash is no crash, and they use fleet data to optimize the safety of all Teslas at scale. And then over at the right, all modern Teslas come with a suite of external cameras, additional sensors, and onboard computing that enable advanced safety features like automatic emergency braking, lane departure warning, forward and side collision warning, obstacle aware acceleration, blind spot warnings, vulnerable road user detection, and more through over the air software updates. So this is a really big deal. Not only is your car amazingly safe when it rolls off the factory floor, it gets safer and safer over time because it's getting over the air software updates. Very, very few other car companies are as safe as Tesla's and they don't get safer over time. This is really unique and it's good that Tesla is calling this out in their impact report. Next up, Tesla tells us not all active safety features are created equal. Our active safety features are powered by cameras, a neural network computer, and learnings from our fleet of over 6 million vehicles with billions of miles driven. Built on a deep neural network, Tesla Vision deconstructs the vehicle's environment at greater levels of reliability than classical vision processing techniques can. The system also continually improves over time with accumulated fleet miles. And then of course they show us their scores and you can see in particular the Model Y and Model S both got 98% on Euro NCAP safety assist rating. That is a pretty darn amazing score. But more importantly, Teslas all come with this vision system and neural network built in. So even if you're not using full self-driving, not the full extent of everything, just the basic autopilot that comes with the car makes the car much, much safer to drive than any other car that's out there. Then quickly, you can see that they've got five stars in basically every safety test. So they're not just meeting, but exceeding safety standards. And then of course, we've got my favorite slide. Safety is enhanced with driver assist technologies. Miles driven before one accident in 2023 were 5.64 million miles with driver assistant technologies engaged. In other words, autopilot or full self-driving. 
Tesla vehicles with no active safety were 1.24 million miles before one accident, and the US fleet average was only 670,000 miles before one accident. Now, you will note if you watched my last video, and definitely check it out if you haven't, that 5.64 is well below 7.39 million miles before one accident. This is, of course, 2023 data. Q1 of 2024 pushed this number way, way up from 5.64 to 7.39 million miles before one accident on average. So definitely check out that video. I'll leave a link at the end of this video for that. Then we get this really interesting chart here. Unfortunately, there is no x-axis. It shows zero, but it doesn't show what the collision rate is. So, so you can really only gather the trend, but basically Tesla is telling us that their driver rating system, which they use for insurance and they used to use to get the full self-driving beta back in the day, that it incentivizes people to get higher safety scores. And when they do, their collision rate goes way down. So you can see people with the top 10% of safety scores have a collision rate of maybe you know 40% of that of people in the zero to 60 category. So that is a substantial improvement. And obviously you can get better over time. If you use this, if you sort of gamify the safety score and you try to get a better score, then you end up being a safer driver. And that's really, really cool. And then we turn to a passive slash active safety system, automatic emergency braking, which continues to improve according to Tesla. Vehicles equipped with Tesla Vision, our camera-based vision-only detection system, can recognize and react to encroaching vehicles far outside the field of view of traditional sensors. These developments have been validated through extensive testing and millions of fleet miles through the use of shadow mode. Shadow mode is where the car predicts what to do and then it looks at a good human driver and figures out whether it did the right thing. And then it learns from that how to be a better driver. So some things it can do, it can avoid turning into the path of a pedestrian crossing the road, it can avoid turning into the path of an oncoming vehicle, and it can avoid traveling toward a vehicle on a perpendicular path. So all of these situations are outside of the normal realm of radar-based automatic emergency braking, because number one, AEB traditionally uses radar. Radar has a very low resolution, and so it can't really see human beings or small objects like that. It's good at detecting things like cars, but not humans or something. The second thing is that the traditional radar systems only face forward so they can really only see what's in front. But of course, a Tesla can see 360 degrees. So if you're trying to make a left-hand turn and it sees a person to your left that you don't see as the driver, it can engage the braking system and avoid hitting that person. And you might not even have noticed that they were there until it was too late. And then again, we turn to something really unique about Tesla. They can use the new data to improve pre-crash safety and they can feed that back into your vehicle. You don't have to buy a new vehicle to get this advantage. They say they can learn from any crash, whether simulated or real, we can learn from any crash to help optimize the protection of occupants and reduce the likelihood of injury. And because our vehicles are connected to Tesla, we can further leverage this philosophy by deploying new safety capabilities and improvements over the air as a software update. And then really, really interestingly, we leverage our ever-growing data set to help ensure occupants receive the best possible restraints, such as seat belts and airbags for the impact they are involved in and design innovative restraint systems. The pace with which we can conduct these studies has accelerated by automating our data pipelines and leveraging machine learning to analyze large data sets. As the capability of driver assistance advances, the nature of the crash exposure to our fleet will change. And basically what they mean by that is fewer and fewer crashes will take place and fewer and fewer injuries will take place. So this is another really big reason to want to drive a Tesla. Even if you get involved in a crash, the odds of your safety go way, way up from a standard vehicle. And then for those who believe that radar is still necessary, in 2021, we removed radar from our sensor suite. This improved safety while simultaneously simplifying engineering by removing a noisy signal. Model 3 scored better in both pedestrian, including nighttime tests, and urban crash avoidance scenarios under the Euro NCAP protocols with Tesla Vision only. So take that radar advocates. And then to address the elephant in the room, Tesla talks about over the air software updates as opposed to recalls. And note that they say that 90 percent of their vehicles recalled globally in 2023 did not require a trip to the service center. So basically it was an over the air update like you get on your phone and not an actual recall. So Tesla's immense proficiency at over the air updates means that you don't even have to recall a vehicle if there's some sort of safety issue under almost all circumstances. And then we get to fire safety. So you can just look at this graph and it makes complete sense. You can see vehicle fires per billion miles. Tesla's are about 11 times safer to drive in terms of vehicle fires than internal combustion engine vehicles. So enough said about that. 
And then finally, this slide, this is really interesting. Grid stability is required for decarbonization. So in other words, if you're going to have renewable energy sources like wind and solar, those are intermittent. They, the sun doesn't shine all the time. The wind doesn't blow all the time. So what you need in combination with that is batteries. And Tesla as an energy company, as well as a transportation company, is well suited to help with that. As we decarbonize the economy and electrify everything, grid expansion and stability will be more important than ever. Pairing renewables with energy storage is the best way to stabilize and grow the grid, while simultaneously making the required greenhouse gas emissions reductions needed to avoid the worst outcomes of climate change. So that's a really interesting and it turns out pertinent slide to throw in with safety. All right, so that's just a few pages of Tesla's 2023 impact report. In the comments, definitely let me know what you think about all of this and XAI's Gigafactory for Compute. In the meantime, I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.